This is a special edition of Focus Insights on the Southern University Ag Center. The Delta variant surging across this country. It has become extremely clear that our current recommendations um, on their own, we're the worst in the country in terms of this COVID surge. A medical health crisis in Louisiana. I'm Dexter Newman with the Southern University Ag Center, and we also have co-hosting with us today, Nicolette Gordon. And standing by, we also have joining with us today, Louisiana's state health officer. In other words, the top medical official in the State Department of Health, some folks call it LDH. We have with us Dr. Joseph Cantor. It's good seeing you today, Dr. Cantor. Hey, thanks, it's really, really good to be with you. I wish it was under better circumstances, to be honest. Uh, but it's good to be with you. It's good to talk about some some really, um, really important issues. I'm looking forward to it. Yes, sir. And uh, with that being said, we'll move right into it, Dr. Cantor, because uh, we know you're busy and so much is going on with the spread of the Delta variant right now across the country and definitely in the state of Louisiana. Uh, first of all, what are variants and specifically uh, the Delta variant? Where did it come from? Yeah, it, it came from from COVID itself, and I'll kind of walk through how, how this works. Um, this is this is a normal process of how viruses work. Um, anytime a virus spreads, transmits from me to you, you to someone else, um, it, it doesn't copy itself 100% accurate, accurately. There's always these random mutations that are um, by chance. It's a fact of life. It's actually how you know natural selection and and that evolution happen. These random mutations. Now, 99.9% .9 of the time, these mutations end up being irrelevant. They don't change anything. It, the virus acts the exact same. Every now and then, on, on rare occasions, the mutation is not irrelevant. It actually changes the dynamics of, of the virus, makes it more transmissible, you know, easier to spread, makes it more virulent or more dangerous, it makes people get sicker from it. Um, every now and then, it, it changes that. When that happens, then we call that a variant. The, the, the virus that has that new mutation is just called a variant of it. And then that ends up growing. It, you know, if, if it's a variant, most times it spreads easier, which means it's gonna go infect more people and the amount of that variant out there is gonna grow. And we've seen that a number of times. I mean, people remember we were worried about the UK variant, which is now called the alpha variant. We were worried about the Brazilian variant, which we called P1 for a while. And uh, you know we're worried about the India variant, which is now referred to as the Delta variant. It's just a little mutation from the initial COVID virus that happened by a rare chance to be very significant. Um, so what we know now about the Delta variant is that it's much more transmissible. It spreads much more quickly. It's much more aggressive. It's making people sicker. And what really scares me, it's, it's making kids sicker than, than, than the other viruses did um it's the same covid otherwise it's just a little bit a little bit different one of the challenging things with these variants is it's oftentimes difficult to predict if a variant is going to become something to be concerned about or not until it gets out there it spreads and you see what happens you can't really look at the genetic code and predict okay this one's going to be a bad one you oftentimes have to just see what happens and the uk variant which is now alpha didn't cause us a lot of problems, but for whatever reason, Delta really is causing a lot of problems. Now, Dr. Cantor, I, I heard you mention that uh, children are getting this. So what is the average age of, you know, people who are catching the Delta variant? Well, it, it, it is going down a little bit. I'll tell you, Nicolette, that data is coming in fast and furious right now. So we're kind of doing our best to, to parse through it and, and make sense. The average age of the hospitalized patient with COVID is a few years younger now than it was before Delta took off. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, we've done a decent job vaccinating older people. About 80% of everyone in Louisiana who's 65 years of age and older have a, has at least initiated the vaccine series. We haven't done as good of a job vaccinating people younger than that. But Older people are, are, have a good vaccine coverage. And so we're seeing less old people get sick than we did before. We're still seeing some, but, but not as many. So relatively speaking, there's more younger people in the hospital. On top of that, this Delta variant seems to be uh, more able to make kids sicker than the previous variants were. So we're seeing as a raw number, 
more kids get hospitalized too. I'll tell you what our children's hospitals are seeing is they're already very busy because we're having a lot of RSV, which is another type of virus, a common virus that we don't typically see this early in the year. They're seeing a lot of that for whatever reason earlier than they normally do. So they're already, already pretty busy. So the numbers are going up. We'll probably get better data on how much they're going up in a week or two, I would think. But when you talk to doctors and pediatricians in particular, they're telling you they're seeing more sick kids now for whatever reason than they ever have in prior points during this pandemic. So are you seeing different um, symptoms with the Delta variant as opposed to, you know, regular COVID-19? I wouldn't say different. I would just say more severe symptoms and quicker symptoms. The symptoms end up being essentially the same, but people are seeing them earlier on with Delta. It's, it's more aggressive. And what we know now is if you're infected with Delta, the amount of virus in your body can be up to a thousand times more than it would have been if you're infected with another type of COVID another strain of COVID. So it's just more powerful. So before when it might have taken three or four days for someone to develop symptoms after they were exposed, we're seeing now people develop symptoms within a day and a half after Delta. And before where someone's symptoms might have been relatively mild, maybe um, sinus congestion and um, you know a runny nose and upper respiratory infection type symptoms, now we're seeing more people get severe symptoms, pneumonia, real, real shortness of breath, you know, requiring hospital stays and ICU. So it's more a difference of severity than it is of quality. Okay. Uh, Dr. Cantor, what uh, are your chances of survival if contracting the Delta variant uh, by being unvaccinated? Also, is the Delta variant more deadly than uh, COVID-19? Yeah. It is. You know, I mean, your chances of survival really depend on conditions that are not at your control. <laughs> um, depends on how old you are, and it depends on what underlying medical conditions you are. And if you have uh, some serious underlying medical conditions, and if you even have some not so serious medical underlying, uh, underlying medical conditions, your risk for complications, your risk for being hospitalized, and your risk from dying is significantly higher than it is in someone who has no conditions. And unfortunately, we have a lot of conditions in Louisiana. <laughs> We have, uh, we're, we're not the healthiest state, let's, let's face it. You know, we have a lot of diabetes, a lot of high blood pressure, and that's hurting us as it comes to COVID. Our death rates are higher because we, we have a population that has a lot of underlying health conditions. And I, I, I don't wanna, you know, overly scare people. If, if, if you get infected with COVID, the odds are you're not gonna need to be hospitalized. You're more likely to be mild than you are to be hospitalized. If you're hospitalized, you're more likely to just stay on a regular floor than you are to be in the ICU. You're, 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 you're not greater than 50% to require hospitalization or die, but those numbers are going up from what they were before. And when you extrapolate that over a population, it goes up, the numbers go up quite dramatically. You know, the amount of people that get sick go up quite dramatically. So to put us in perspective, over the past four weeks, the number of people hospitalized with COVID in Louisiana has increased by a factor of six, by a factor of six. Four weeks ago, we had 250 people hospitalized with COVID, and today we have over 1,600. And it's going up. There's, there's no sign that that's slowing right now. Okay. Now, many of us, we've heard in the news about fully vaccinated people contracting COVID and or the Delta variant. It's a two-part two question. Why is that? And also, have any of the vaccines been shown to be more effective in the fight against COVID and the Delta variant? It, it, it's a nuanced question, um, and, and it's important to talk about. These vaccines provide excellent but not absolute protection, and that's a really important concept to do it. And, um, you know, these vaccines, when it came out, we were told they were 94 95% effective. I'll tell you, in the world of vaccines, that's a home run. That's a grand slam. I mean, you, you rarely have vaccines anywhere close to that. And, and to give you an example, the flu vaccine we get every year, you know, it's a different vaccine every year. They try and match what the flu is going to look like that year. And if we get a year where the flu vaccine is 65% effective, that's great. We rarely don't get that good. 95% is unheard of. It's, it's extraordinary. But that's not 100%. You know, and that 5% balance 
is a lot more crucial when you have a lot more COVID out there. You know, if you're just swimming in COVID, for lack of a better term, and we are swimming in COVID right now, that 5% risk adds up pretty darn quickly. That's what we're seeing now with these breakthrough infections. So by and large, if you are fully vaccinated, and fully vaccinated means you've had one dose of the J&J &J vaccine and you're 14 days out from that, or you've had both doses of the Pfizer or Moderna and you're at least 14 days out, then you're fully vaccinated. If you're fully vaccinated, you have really, really good protection against severe disease, meaning being hospitalized or dying from COVID. You have good, but not, not excellent protection against just getting the virus, Delta. And unfortunately, what we're seeing now is people who are fully vaccinated, we're seeing some breakthrough cases. And I'll tell you, of everyone who's hospitalized, of those 1,600 patients who are hospitalized today, COVID, about nine out of 10 are fully vaccinated, which means one in 10 aren't. That's, that's the breakthrough rate. And I think that that breakthrough rate might go up a little bit as our cases go up, as, as there's more COVID out there, as COVID has a greater opportunity to break through your protection if you are fully vaccinated. That's actually why you see the mask recommendation now being extended to people who are fully vaccinated. We said that last Friday with the governor, and then yesterday the CDC came out and said that too. It's, it's because while these vaccines provide excellent, excellent protection against getting very, very sick, unfortunately with Delta, we are seeing people who are vaccinated get it, not get that sick, but still spread it to other people. And that's a big concern right now. So Dr. Cancer, I have to ask, do the masks really protect us against the Delta variant? When it's used on a population level, okay. when it's used on a population level, I can tell you if, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make up a number, let's say 20% of the state is masking right now. Mm -hmm. That might be generous, I don't know, depending on, depending on where you live. Um, if that went up to 80%, we would bend this curve and we would, be on the other side going down from the surge right now when it's extrapolated over a population level. You know, if I go into, let's say, a convention now, right now, anywhere in Louisiana, uh, a 500 person convention, if everyone there is unmasked and swimming in COVID, which, which, is, which would be the case right now, even if I wear a mask, I'm still going to be at risk. Okay. If I go into that convention and all 500 people are masked too, it's pretty good protection. Reduction rate. Okay, so are, are there any other things that we can do to protect ourselves against COVID? Yeah, uh, and thanks. Because that's, that, 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 that's probably the most important question that we're going to talk about during this session. Okay. Um, if you're in an indoor space with other people, you got to be wearing a mask, and you got to find a way to make the people around you wearing a mask. That that's the bottom line. Um, even if you're fully vaccinated, until we get out of the surge, I think once we're out of the surge we can lighten up on the masks like we had before. And it was nice, you know, that no one likes wearing a mask. It was nice before, um, but we're in a surge now, regardless of whether you're vaccinated or not, if you're in an indoor space with other people around you, that's not your house, you need to be wearing a mask and everyone else around you wearing a mask. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing, as much as we're able, distance. So make sure you're using as much space as the room allows. Distance as much as possible. If you're able to hold your event, outdoors, do it. It's going to be safer. I know it's hot as heck and it's 90 degrees today too. It's been 90 degrees all week. Oh, so I, I, oh yeah. Oh, I, I get that. It's hard, but it's going to be a little bit cooler next week. If you're able to with the weather, it's safer outdoors. If you can't be outdoors, but you can reasonably increase your ventilation, windows and fans, that helps too. And then if you're holding a big event, you know, if, if you've got some type of reunion or, or um, conference coming up, if it's going to be in the next three and four weeks, think if it's reasonable to you to postpone that. Uh, I think now that we're surging, it's, it's not the time. You know, you're not being ordered to, but um, if it's reasonable to postpone it, I really would do that right now. Right now. Okay. So COVID and the Delta variant, can it lie dormant in your body for weeks uh, without you having a positive test? No, not really. Um, you know, the, the, the typical timeline after one gets exposed is two to, two to 14 days. Okay. Um, if you don't test positive within two and 14 days, you're, you're pretty much in the clear. But I'll, I'll tell you with the amount of COVID out there in Louisiana right now, most people are just gonna be exposed to it on a daily basis. 
So I mean, if I were to go make groceries now, I, I guarantee you I will be exposed to COVID um, just because it's, it's, it's out there so much right now. Okay. okay, Dr. Cantor, you must be from Louisiana. You said make grocery. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually not, but I, I've been there for, for long enough that's rubbed off of me. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, Dr. Cantor, uh, what is the percentage of people infected with COVID-19 that get reinfected with the Delta variant, uh, vaccinated and/or unvaccinated? Yeah, it's it's still a pretty relatively small percentage. So. Less than 5% of uh, cases now are people who had had COVID before, whether, whether it was Delta or not, L less than 5%. So it, it, it's not a, not a giant, giant statistic. That said, we do see it. Um, and I'll tell you just clinically, because I'm an ER doc and I still, I still work in the ER. Uh, I've seen patients infected three times now. I've seen a couple of patients infected three times. I've seen a number of patients, and I know some people infected twice. What we know now, is that the protection you get from these vaccines is more robust, meaning a stronger protection than what you get from natural infection just from getting COVID itself. It's also more durable protection, meaning it lasts longer. So you do get some protection from just getting the virus, but it's not that strong. You know, you can still get reinfected. You get better protection from getting the vaccine. That's why we recommend if you've had COVID before, we still recommend you get vaccinated because your protection is going to be stronger. You want to wait until you're done with your acute illness. So wait a couple of weeks after you get sick, um, but you still should get vaccinated because it's going to make your protection that much stronger. Well, what about uh, the Lambda variant? How does it weigh in also with uh, what's going on now? Yeah, you know, it, it's really tough to say. So, you know, the, the, the Lambda variant is, is circulating in Peru right now. And um, like we were talking about before, mm -hmm. sometimes it's tough to predict what these variants are going to do. I mean, sometimes all you can do is, is, is watch them, monitor them, and, and kind of be prepared to respond if they prove to be something really worrisome. Um, we don't have a ton of Lambda out there. I mean, the numbers are, are still really, really small. And so we'll watch it and keep an eye on it. And it's really tough to say what's going to happen, whether it's going to be a big problem for us or not. We're just going to have to have to wait and see, to be honest. Okay, so Dr. Cantor, we do know that many people feel privileged and they don't want to wear a mask and don't necessarily want a social distance in the U.S. How many more variants do you think can come if we do not start masking? Uh, a lot, and, and this is the problem. The more transmission that happens, the more there's going to be more variants. Because every time this virus spreads, it's an opportunity for another variant to emerge. The only way to tamp down on these variants is to tamp down on transmission, to stomp out COVID. Once you stomp it out, there's going to be no more variants. If it's growing like wildfire, you're going to have a lot more variants. As bad as Delta is, and it is, it is the worst that we have seen ever in this pandemic in Louisiana. Let me be clear. This, is, this Delta variant is the worst thing that we have seen yet. As bad as it is, we remain lucky and, and fortunate. And the reason I say that is that the three vaccines we have are still a pretty good match for Delta, as bad as Delta is. And there's no guarantee that that's gonna be the case for whatever new variant is gonna come down the road. No guarantee at all. The way that we prevent that possibility is by doing all we can to stomp out transmission now. And the best way to do that is to get everyone vaccinated. You know, you get enough people vaccinated, your transmission plummets, you don't have any more variants. You're, you're in the clear at that point. Okay. Well. Uh, Dr. Cantor, what you said earlier, uh, previously, about this being the worst, um, as far as media, um, do you think they're stressing it enough to, to where people sh you know, should want to get vaccinated? I think now they are. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's tough, and, and let's be honest, this, is, this whole thing has just been politicized you know, from, from, from day one, and it's, it's tough to break through that. And, and even if it wasn't politicized, Everything with COVID has been fast paced and confusing. And, and I think, you know, when I talk to people that haven't yet been vaccinated, I mean, most of the time their questions are really reasonable questions. There are reasonable answers, but I, you know, it's like, I don't fault anyone for having these, these very reasonable questions because COVID has been really confusing and most of the media coverage and the political discourse hasn't helped that much. Um, you know, I think now that hospitals are like in, in Louisiana right now, you go talk to someone that, that works in a hospital 
they're going to tell you straight up what's happening. And it's scary. And, and, so, and so now, you know, the media coverage this week in Louisiana, at least, has been very on point, I think. And we see that in the numbers. Uh, we've seen a dramatic increase in our vaccinations. If there's ever any silver lining about what we're seeing now is that vaccinations are going up. We doubled our vaccinations last week and we're on pace to double it again this week. Um, and I think that's because people are looking around and saying, this is, this is bad, I'm scared. And, and they're saying that because they either know someone who's sick and a lot of people know people who are sick right now, or they're turning on the news and seeing what's, what's happening. So I think the message is getting across here Across the country, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think it's still really politicized. I think you still see a lot of charlatans and opportunists say things that are just crazy, um, that 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 have no benefit other their than their political gain. You know, just trying to blow off the science or trash the CDC or uh, and that that's just nonsense. You know, but once it gets real, like it is in Louisiana, it's just, it's just so so hard to ignore that. I think the real message, um, the the truthful message, really breaks through that. Okay. And uh, Dr. Cantor, uh, rabies virus, it affects uh, the central nervous system and transmission is normally through a bite of an infected animal. Does COVID-19 and different variants affect the central nervous system? You know, it can. It, it, it can. And that, that's one of the, the scary things about COVID. You know, most people that get COVID, if they're going to get sick, they get respiratory symptoms. They get pneumonia, their, their lungs fail, they get put on a, uh, a ventilator and need a lot of oxygen. That's the typical way it presents, but not always. Um, we know COVID can cause blood clots in people. And when you have a blood clot in your legs, it's called a, a, a DVT or deep vein thrombosis, or it can go up to your lungs, uh, or it can go up to your heart and go up to your brain even. It goes up to your brain, it causes a stroke, and that causes neurologic manifestations. So um, we don't think the COVID virus attacks nerves the way that rabies does, but it attacks other parts of your body that then cause real problems for your nervous system. That's just the acute phase. That's just when you're immediately sick. The other side of this is what people are calling long COVID or long haulers, or people that get infected with COVID. Maybe they get sick. Maybe they don't even have any symptoms. And then they have these persistent symptoms down the road that last months, months. And that can include lethargy, confusion. People are describing uh, brain fog or brain haze, just not being able to think as clearly and crisp as they used to be able to. And I'll be honest, we don't really understand why this is. COVID is causing these long-term symptoms and not everyone, but a subset of people that get infected for reasons that we don't really understand. And we think it can be up to 25 or even 45% of people that get COVID are feeling some type of long-term symptom. And some of these are really debilitating, feeling, feeling like they're in a brain fog and can't get out of it. And we don't have good reasons yet. We will, but, but not yet as to why that's really happening. Okay. And Dr. Cantor, uh, is there anything else you would like to inform the public about concerning uh, the Delta variant in hopes to encourage them about uh, getting vaccinated? Yeah. Um, listen, Delta is different. Delta is different. And um, I, I'll tell you, I, I had thought that we were in, you know, in, in, in a much better place. And, um, you know, as much as everyone else, the, the past few months, I really enjoyed feeling like my life was getting back to normal, you know, not wearing a mask, going out to eat, hanging out with friends. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I like that too. Um, and it's a real kick in the gut to, to be back here. Let's, let's just be honest about it. But um, that's where we are. Delta is different. It's, it's way more aggressive than anything that we have seen before. And we need to make sure we're using every possible tool we have to fight back against this. That means wearing masks right now, that means distancing when you can right now, and that means getting vaccinated. This is pure and simple. Um, if you have yet to get vaccinated, I, I guarantee you the questions and doubts that you have are very similar to what other people have as well. And there's probably a good answer or response. If you haven't talked to your doctor about it, talk to them, because I guarantee you what the questions you have in your mind are the same as a lot of people do, and you owe it to yourself to get the information from your doctor and not from, you know, Facebook or wherever else. So do yourself that favor. You 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 really do deserve it to, to get the real real information from someone who knows what they're talking about. Okay, Dr. Cantor. Well, you've dropped a wealth of information uh, to us today and our viewing audience that will check this out, social media, television, what have you. And we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, which we really do know that you are 
We're not just saying that we know that you really are. And um, we hope that we can get you back on again at a later date with some other information other than we're dealing with Delta and whatever else. And hopefully this will be the end of this uh, COVID-19 virus at this time. So we thank you for joining us, Doc. Thank you. The pleasure really is all mine. I would love to come back when I have good news to share and talk about. And hopefully we can do that sooner rather than later. But thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. The mayor of New Orleans. We have been here before. We've seen the movie. And what was once unpreventable, today is preventable. A medical health crisis in Louisiana. Good day and thank you for joining us, Dr. Bear. And today we'll start with asking you about COVID-19 as it pertains to children. Dr. Bear. Are children more likely to get COVID and or the Delta variant as compared to adults? Well, well I will tell you, everyone is more likely to get COVID-19, the Delta variant than anybody else. Children are no exception. This Delta variant is really like a thousand times more contagious. If you can imagine when we were talking about the Alpha variant and then you sneezed, let's just say one person would get it or that particle, they would have one particle in that uh, that sneeze. Well, think about there'll be a, a thousand particles in that sneeze. Now, that's the best way I could try to explain it. And so with children, children breathe faster and they are all over the place. So just imagine that children are more susceptible. We are seeing younger people die and we're seeing younger people get this infection and we're seeing the average age of people being admitted to the hospital being lower. Now, not much lower as far as the admissions, as far as the age, but we are seeing younger people get this. In Mississippi, we had about 10 kids in the ICU from COVID-19 and, and that, was, uh, that, that was a lot. So uh, the children are susceptible and they're more susceptible with this uh, than, they, uh, than they were with the, the last variant or the original alpha variant. Okay, Doc. Well, what advice can you give to parents or the guardians if they have children under the age of 12 for safe, safeguarding their children since there's no vaccine available for them and that age group at this time? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I would just try to encourage the mask, you know, because the adults are the ones that don't really want to wear the mask, right? The children, they, especially the ones five and six years old, that's kind of all they know. They went to school, you know, and that, that was their thing. They see it a little bit as a fashion statement now. They don't really have a problem. A lot of this masking has become very political. And I think we need to remove that because you have to just think about Yes, you know, a mask could get dirty. Yes, a mask can't get contaminated. Same thing with gloves. Gloves are good, but you still have to wash your hands as much as you would have washed the gloves. You see what I'm saying? So just because you right. have on gloves doesn't mean that you're immune. Just like scrubs. People say, oh, well, why? you know, you have scrubs on. Scrubs aren't any particular different than any cotton, right? So you still have to clean stuff. So wear that mask and keep your children about six feet away from people that are not vaccinated. That's going to be very, that's going to be the hard thing to do because children are just all over the place, but keep that mask on and keep that, that mask washed and do the things. This, this is my mantra, wash up, mask up, separate and vaccinate. If we can do those simple things, those are the things that got us to, to keeping the numbers down. So that's that hashtag now. Wash up, mask up, separate, and vaccinate. Okay, Doc, that sounds good. And the Southern accent is going to push mm -hmm. that for you. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so what are some symptoms of the Delta variant that parents should be aware of? Well, the, the symptoms of the Delta variant are really not much different than any of the other variants. And I want people to kind of wrap their minds around that because I don't want them to think that the Delta variant is, is some strange thing that's not coronavirus. The Delta variant, just so we can be clear, is the same thing that we, that we were calling the Indian mutation or the Indian variant that went through India pretty, pretty uh, rapidly and caused a lot of problems. The thing is, did we tell you about the Delta variant? It is really a 12-point mutation. It used to be called the double mutation. There's been a lot of names. And it has the South African variant in it and the Brazilian variant in it. And that's why it was called the double mutation because there was two really big ones. But they're really 12 mutations. And it uh, is the same thing that we used to call the, uh, from the variant from India, all right? So the, the question is, what are the symptoms? We're gonna have fever. We're gonna have myalgia, which is uh, uh, muscle pain. We're gonna have some, maybe some nausea, some vomiting, some headaches, some malaise. 
Um, and some people will have no symptoms at all. Children, most of the time, will have no symptoms at all. So what we have to remember, though, is that they can still be carriers. And the CDC has come out to say today that even if you're vaccinated, you can still actually be a carrier and spread it. And that was something that they kind of changed up on. Um, and so, um, yes, you, the, those are the symptoms. Can people fully vaccinated that get a breakthrough infection transmit the Delta variant? Yes, and, and so we, that, that's what I was meaning. We, you know, we can actually have some spread. We can transmit, not as much. Now, let's, let's be very clear about this. Not as much as if you weren't vaccinated. And, and we, we're looking at this very, very closely because that's one of the things that people say, you know, well, can you still get COVID-19 from the vaccine? I mean, from, from uh, when you've been vaccinated. Can you get, let's say that again. So that's one of the things people have been saying. Can you still get covid yeah, if you've been vaccinated. Yeah, COVID uh, it, it is a serious disease and the vaccine is not a cure. You know, it, it, it's a helpful prevention. So for example, I'll give you an example of this. People use birth control pills. Are they 100% effective? No, it's a prevention. But do you stop taking birth control pills? No, people use a seat belt so they don't get in an accident. But you, or could you die if you get in an accident with a seatbelt on? Yes, will you stop wearing your seat belt? No. So that's the same thing I want people to think about this COVID-19 vaccine. So can you spread it? Yes. But can you spread it as much as without the vaccine? No. Hmm. Just, as, just that simple. Just keep everything just simple. simple. Let's not complicate these things when that's it's right. dealt with the, this virus. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Doc, I wanted to ask you um, another question we have for you. Because people, they feel so privileged in not wearing masks and social distancing in the U.S., how many more variants do you think may come from this if people aren't wearing masks? What is the potential? Just a ball. Well, the, it, yeah, well, it, it's it, it's a very difficult question to answer because you know we started using the uh, the uh, Greek alphabet uh, nomenclature, and this is funny because you know I'm alpha, right? So right. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eight, I was, I'm kappa, lambda, mu, psi, omicron, pyro, sigma, tau, psi, pi, chi, psi, omega, right? I pledge, right? So the point is, <laughs> we're in <laughs> delta, but we also have lambda, which is in Peru, mm -hmm. okay? And so we got a long alphabet to go. And just like with the hurricanes last year, we thought that once we got to Z, we couldn't have any more hurricanes, but we did, didn't we? So yes, you sure did. It, there's, a, there's an, inf exactly, there's an infinite amount of variants you could have. But let me make this point very clear. The, vac the, the vaccine can prevent you from getting very ill with this disease, okay? Um, there are a lot of people in the hospital right now with COVID-19 in Louisiana, but we don't have anybody in the hospital from a side effect from the vaccine, all right? Think about that. But when we look at who, how, this how this virus is mutating, the virus mutates when it's infecting people. So the more people that are infected, the more mutations we can get. The more people that are not vaccinated, the more infections. So really, in a nutshell, the people that are not vaccinated are the ones that are allowing the, back, the virus to get into them. And then they are the ones allowing the mutations to happen because if we didn't have any infections, we really wouldn't have a lot of mutations. The virus is trying to live. The virus is trying to live and kill you. That's its job. And so if it's infecting you, it's trying to figure out as it's replicating how it can be more virulent, how it can kill you better, how it can kill you, how it can kill more people. So the more it's infecting, the more it is mutating. And that's why we have to get everybody vaccinated. So do it, don't be selfish. Do it for other people if you don't wanna, if you don't wanna uh, uh, get the vaccine for yourself, do it for other people so we won't have any more mutations. Okay, and doc, I like the way you're explaining this. You're keeping it simple, A, B, C, one, two, three. It's just that yes, simple in what's going on with this virus. I think that people are complicating things quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, if people are having concerns about taking the vaccine, what words of encouragement would you share with them about getting the vaccine? Yeah, I, I, I'm a straight shooter, man. And I want everybody, while they're listening to this, I want them to take out their phone and I want them to Google something called Stevens Johnson's syndrome. This is a syndrome that you can get if you take a, a, a drug. And I'll tell you what the drug is. If you look in the package insert, It'll tell you every time you take this drug, not, not if you take it a bunch of times, but each time you take this drug, you can get this disease. And when you see the picture of this disease, it's a horrible allergic reaction. Your skin gets all messed up, your lips fall off and you could die, okay? Every time you take this one drug, 
You know what that drug is? Ibuprofen, okay? And we take ibuprofen like Tic Tacs, don't we? I mean, M&Ms all day. Also, Tylenol could cause it. Also, any um, uh, antibiotic can cause it, okay? So, if, so you either got to live by the sword or you're going to die by the sword. So if you think that you are taking a stand to not take this vaccine because of whatever reason you're thinking of, then don't take any medicine because all of the medicines have been approved by the FDA and people are saying, oh, well, this isn't approved by the FDA. That's not new either. This is an emergency use authorization. On a college campus, we require the meningitis B vaccine for you to actually go and be on a college campus as a student. That was an emergency use authorization too, because I did the clinical trials for it. I'm over the clinical trials for the monoclonal antibodies right now. That's what I do, right? So people still gave the meningitis vaccine, the meningitis B vaccine, and on campus it's required. So it is approved. So if you, that's your argument that, oh, I don't want to take it because it's not approved. Well, that's not a good argument either because it's going to be approved. And the thing is, it just takes time because we have to go through the protocols. That's the FDA's protocol. So there is no reason for you not to get the vaccine and do it for the culture because I'm sick and tired of, of black folks dying. I'm losing recipes. I'm losing uh, music. I'm losing stories that people need to tell. And I'm losing, we're losing our culture because we are dying more. Get vaccinated and quit the nonsense of, oh, I, I don't know. And I'm a, I'm a very straight shooter when I tell you this. But one time a guy told me, man, I don't know about this mRNA vaccine. I said, man, you ain't never even heard of mRNA before this day. What makes you think that you, you know, you're going to watch, you know, just watch a Facebook video and think you are going to be the, the expert. You have to trust the experts that have been doing this for 25 years, and that's us. So please get the vaccine. Doc, it's great having you here and joining us today at the Southern University Ag Center. And as the Southern University Ag Center is doing its part to spread information about the importance of getting vaccinated, we once again thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Thank you, man. And let me tell you something. We're going to get through this thing. Wash up, mask up, separate, and vaccinate. We're going to make it happen. You got it, Doc. Take care, Dr. A. Bear. Thank you. This has been a special edition of Focus, Insights of the Southern University Ag Center. The mayor of New Orleans. We have been here before, we've seen the movie. Today it's preventable. The governor of Louisiana. We are the worst in the country in terms of this COVID surge. A medical health crisis in Louisiana. This virus may be around all year long, all the time. That's what it's done to us so far. And we could expect it to stay with us. So our, our real, really only hope is that vaccine. Now that COVID-19 vaccines are available, it's critical that all of us get it. We won't get through this unless everyone takes part. The vaccine is fine. I've got mine. Now it's time to get yours. It's a team effort. So let's play fair. If we all pull together, it's a win-win for us all. This is a segment we call Blast from the Past. Welcome back. We spoke with Dr. Abdullahi. Uh, he's professor and project director for urban forestry and natural resources. Uh, he spoke with us about uh, major urban forestry issues that are facing our nation. Let's take a look. We're glad to have you with us today, Dr. Abdullahi. What are the major urban forestry issues facing the nation at this time? So one of the major issues um, facing the nation is uh, the increased urbanization and uh, loss of land fragmentation uh, and the issues that are arising as it relates to the environmental issues uh, and how we can remediate that using urban forestry. Uh, and um, the other issues related to human uh, health, uh, so, uh, socio and uh, psychological um, uh, improvement through urban forestry. Uh, and uh, more than anything, uh, the resources that we have, how we use that to optimize the benefits that uh, urban forestry provides uh, for our nation uh, uh, areas, urban areas and rural areas. Uh, so um, in, in a nutshell, uh, there are uh, many issues that are 
uh, um, global in nature. Uh, we have um, extreme events that are constantly uh, uh, causing problems for our cities and uh, many centers uh, that, um, of human activities. Uh, so urban forestry uh, could uh, play a great role uh, to provide uh, ecological services, uh, improve ecology of the system that we live in, uh, and at the same time uh, improve the uh, quality of life so people can work and play, uh, and uh, also uh, how to integrate all of that into a system where we could uh, increase the opportunities uh, rather than uh, losing um, a lot of benefits uh, from uh, our mother nature. What are the major issues or research problems uh, that you're working on to enhance uh, Louisiana at this time? Yes, uh, Louisiana, as uh, we are fortunate to have a tremendous uh, vegetation cover in Louisiana. At the same time, uh, with the rainfall, amount of rainfall, a tremendous rainfall, we get like in South Louisiana, we get more than 60 inches of rainfall sometimes even more, uh, and also with extreme events that we are experiencing. Uh, that adds to some of the disturbances. Uh, we lose trees, we uh, have flooding, uh, and uh, so um, if you look at the benefits that urban forestry provides, uh, urban forestry or vegetation cover and uh, this green infrastructure uh, actually improves uh, the uh, not only the health of the urban areas, uh, but also uh, remediates the, uh, uh, the flooding impact and also to some extent the cushion and prevents flooding from runoff and from uh, other disasters. So the more green space, the more green infrastructure we have, urban green infrastructure, we have less uh, urban uh, flooding issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, the same could be said about uh, air quality, uh, you know, the more vegetation we have or proper vegetation, we would be able to remediate the pollution that is caused uh, uh, in urban areas. So these are all remediation strategies, strategies that by using proper trees, plants, uh, and we call it the right tree for the right site or right species for the right site, uh, with the proper management, proper techniques, and proper, proper models, we are able to uh, remediate and make recommendations uh, as how to use urban forestry uh, to optimize the benefits and reduce the costs. So with that said, uh, we have one line of projects that we are conducting in Louisiana, and that's uh, mostly geared toward the uh, tree assessment of urban forest uh, ecological benefits. Uh, and uh, the other one is how to uh, enhance the urban uh, forest mm -hmm. as it relates to soil, as it relates to water. And uh, recently we, we have come up with a product called uh, biochar, which is really coming from the urban wood waste. However, it is uh, proven to be uh, very uh, important in providing uh, enhancing soil or rhizosphere uh, so we can grow more trees uh, and uh, um, uh, create a better environment for our vegetation. Overgrown lots, would that be considered more of your urban forestry or what, how could that be handled in the urban area? Absolutely, and one area that uh, is very important is uh, invasive species okay. and how to deal with uh, undesirable plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, these, the, these are plants or trees that usually uh, come uh, to um, cause disturbance to our, our, our overall strategy of management strategy. So in order to remediate that, we should choose proper species and also use uh, some biological methods or mechanical methods to deal with that and not to resort too much to chemical methods. Uh, so this would actually help this sustain a better uh, quality of life and uh, reduce the chances of uh, detrimental uh, problems from use of the pesticides, insecticides, and so on and so forth. Uh, so overall is uh, a very proactive approach uh, to improve the health of our urban forest. Uh, and um, also we can use those overgrown materials that you mentioned or undesirable uh, plants and turn them into some other products 
such as we, in uh, one research that we're conducting here, we are actually converting that to biofuel. Hart, what's going on? I'm leaving. Why? What did I do? Not enough. The pressure is too much. I quit. I get it. I can do better. Just please, don't leave. Don't let your heart quit on you. Get your uncontrolled high blood pressure to a healthy range before it's too late. My name is Allison Guidros. Uh, my husband Grant and I run uh, Fullness Farm in Baton Rouge. Uh, we started started farming it in uh, 2015. So we, we've been uh, farms been going for five years now. We're both from Baton Rouge, and um, finished getting my master's degree at LSU, uh, looking at uh, soil health and looking at the soil and on on our farm. And uh, we have two kids. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Yeah, good question. And um, we both don't come from a farming background. My, my dad was a professor at LSU, um, grew up in the city. And we started getting involved in horticulture and growing when we were in college. We went to LSU, we started LSU as undergrads in like 2008, 2009. And uh, that's when there was a big financial crash, you know, and we were, you, whenever you're starting college, you're learning about all kinds of things. And so um, all of it combined kind of pushed us to some, to wanting to do something that was real in some senses. My husband was in finance before, um, but before, before the financial crash and everything. And uh, we joke, he said, uh, he thought that he would work, work a little bit and, and make a lot of money and that's what would make him happy. But now we, uh, we work, we work a lot and make a little bit of money and that makes us happy. <laughs> um, but we just, it's really, we just fell in love with, with growing. Um, I, I worked in community gardens as an undergraduate and then we started a business in, in, um, in college, putting in uh, raised beds for people, designing, installing, and maintaining custom organic raised beds. That was kind of our, that was our tagline. And then um, after we graduated, we got married, and then we worked with Slow Food Baton Rouge, a nonprofit through uh, with AmeriCorps. Did what is like a year of service, and um, and did local food events, uh, school gardens, community gardens. But we got to tour a farm there when we when we were when we were um, working for Slow Food, and they offered us an internship. It was a, a organic farm in Alexandria called Inglewood. It's still going on now, and they were new, just getting started. And so we did a year internship there, and then uh, did another year and a half at another farm in Arkansas, and. Um, with the intention to learn how to really have a farm, a small farm as a business. And um, so then we came back home and, uh, and then that's how we, we, and then we found our way to where we are now. And that's how we, that's how we started. Um, we kind of think of the farm year starting when school year starts. So that's when we try to get all the cool season stuff planted, but we plant every week. Uh, we're, we're planting something every week on the farm. So right now it's a great time to get in like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbages, all your greens, uh, collard greens, mustard greens, kale, Swiss chard, spinach, lettuce. We do a whole lot of lettuce um, <clears throat> on the farm. All, all the roots are really great to do now, turnips and uh, beets and carrots. And, um, and then once, once we get to January, we, we try to get, uh, start thinking about it's, it's in the middle of the winter and it's kind of crazy to think about, but we try to start thinking about when, uh, what, what, what plants we want to have in for the, the warm season. And that's like your kind of things that we kind of think of as vegetables here, which is like squash, okra, peppers, tomatoes, um, you know, eggplants, cucumbers, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, but here, here in, uh, in South Louisiana, we can grow 52 weeks of the year, whereas up, up north, you know, uh, New York or something like that, they, they really only have five months of the year that they can grow in. 
And so it is kind of a challenge to get good growing information for where we are. And so the key things that you look at when you're growing is uh, your zone. So uh, I'm in Baton Rouge. And so we're like 9A, 8B, 8B, 9A. Um, that's the USDA zone. And then you that tells you your average first frost date and uh, last frost date. And uh, on, on anytime you order in seeds and stuff like that, that's kind of what they give you information based off of is first, first frost, last frost date kind of thing. Because tomatoes and stuff like that, if there was a frost, it would, it would kill them. It kills them right away. So you, you want to plant them after your last frost. Yeah, we're actually growing on just an acre right now. Uh, we started with half an acre. And uh, we have perma a permanent bed system where we don't uh, till everything in and reform the beds. The beds are just where, th where they are permanently. And um, they always have something growing in them. So some of the beds might get planted four or five times one year. So it's, it's a, an acre of, of, you know, tilled area, but in the whole year, it might, might be four acres worth of planting or five acres worth of planting because we, we grow so many short, short, quick crops like the lettuces and baby greens and things like that. Well, we've done, we've done different things at different times, but right now it's my husband and I, and then uh, we have an apprentice. And we have different kind of ways that people can work with us. We have, and we, and we personally differentiate them with by volunteers. Then we have interns, which we get quite a bit of, um, student interns from LSU because we're 10 miles from LSU. And then when I was doing my master's degree, uh, and then I also helped teach an organic um, horticulture class, to, to, um, organic horticulture with Dr. Matzenbacher for uh, five years. And so I just had connections with LSU. So we would get uh, interns. And, and those are people that typically are, aren't working for pay and are doing it for class credit. But then we also offer an apprenticeship where somebody's committing to work a year with us. And um, we just feel so indebted to the people that taught us. And so we wanna make sure that we're teaching other people as well. But um, so they, we, they work for us for a year. And at the end of it, the goal is that they, um, they, know, they know how to run a farm, um, run, run their own farm. So we have, we have an apprentice now. So that's what we do and we, uh, there's, I have somebody that comes out and volunteers, but uh, right now that's that's what we do. Um, and my husband and I, we've been doing it for, you know, combined uh, 10 years now or something. So between the two of us, you know, 10 years each farming and then learning before that. So between the two of us, we have a lot of experience. And um, that's what I tell people about the about this kind of, well, it's kind of called market gardening. What we what we're doing um, is kind of the term people use now, um, and it's not land intensive. It really isn't. You know, an acre and there's acre, acre plots everywhere. Um, it's not land intensive. It really isn't that much cap capital intensive. It doesn't cost a whole lot with tools and everything. We use a walk behind tractor and not like a traditional four wheel tractor and all that. Um, but it is knowledge intention. It, intensive it's kind of it's like a trade it's like any kind of trade and uh, I always encourage people if they're really serious about wanting to have a farm is to work under work under somebody and to get have, have some kind of mentor have a mentorship where you can there are just so many you know little nuances and and how everything works if you want to have it as a small small business but everybody can grow food in their in their in their at their home you know everybody should be growing food it's, it, that's not hard to do. Growing the food is the easy part. It's the, if you're having a business, it's, it's the marketing and selling and all that kind of side of it that takes really, uh, and making sure you've got consistent production year round. Yeah, for us, it does, it is like a, a call, it does feel like a calling um, in some senses. Like we do, we live on our farm and work on the farm and uh, we, my husband and I both, we both really love it. And um, 
but it is also a business, you know, it is our, it is our, it is a business as well. And, um, and I think that there's definitely, um, plenty of demand. I think, I think the market demand is there for more, more small farms. And like this, this, we, we look to serve 200 families, um, with our farm. So, so to, to us, it feels like we, there needs to be a farm like ours in every neighborhood, you know, 200 families. That's like, you know, but it, I think, I think it should be thought of as a, a business. And I also think it, it is like, it is also a lifestyle as, as well. Um, you know, it doesn't, it isn't, there isn't like, you know, people talk about, you know, it's really important to have work, home, homework, life separation or whatever, but I don't know, there's a lot of benefits to, to having it be all close together as well. Um, so that I kind of answered your second question first, the first question about um, how has it changed? We definitely have seen um, just customer knowledge grow a lot more whenever we, you know, we, we were selling with the farm the first farm that we worked on, Inglewood and Alexandria, we would drive down, my husband would drive down from Alexandria to Baton Rouge and sell at the Red Stick farm, Farmer's Market every Saturday. Um, and so at the farmer's market, you have an instant connection with the customer and instantly know, get feedback. Do they like it? Do they not? What do they think about the price? What do they think about the quality? All that kind of stuff. And so he really knew what, what customers wanted and it and we used to do a lot more education with the customers and tell them why it's important and all that kind of stuff and now there's just been a lot more documentaries come out and um and maybe maybe just seeing other parts of the country do this this smaller scale uh market market farming focusing on quality instead of quantity um and really developing a relationship with your customers and being a part of the community and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's, that's happening all around the country and maybe people are seeing that and documentaries and whatever, but um, you know, just customer, customer knowledge and everything would be one thing that's really has changed a lot. Um, and demand, demand just is increasing. spring mix that's what we call our our lettuce mix that chain it, it has maybe like you can have from like five to 15 different types of of greens and, and leaves and stuff in there but it's all washed and ready to go but our spring mix is our best seller that's really what we're known for um people people like that you know it comes in a bag washed and ready to go um we we, t we, we tell our customers you know if you're making the effort to get there to come on a Saturday morning to the farmer's market and shop with a local farmer. We wanna make it easy for you once you once you get our product home. So we really try to have all of our products be uh, clean, ready ready for people to use right away. So uh, the spring mix wash and ready to go is, a, is our best seller and our worst seller, maybe like fennel or something like that where didn't really grow up eating it and don't really, there's no, no recipe comes to mind. <laughs> well, I love books as far as resources go. I'm, I'm, I'm more, um, I know more about that than, um, like we have, we haven't done any, any, like any grants or anything like that. So I'm not sure about like, I know that there are those kind of things for, um, beginning farmers especially women and minority veteran uh farmers so if you're any in any of that um and then when we were working on a farm there was the market gardener market gardener came out by uh jean martin fortier that one's excellent um and then there are a lot of uh i really like soil you know i'm interested in soil and so there there are a fair amount of um soil books that are that are really good but um, building soils naturally is is the one that I've been reading most recently. That's really good. And uh, Lean Farm by Ben Hartman is another really good book. Um, and then I would also really look for um, people resources. You know, kind of like I was saying with the mentorship before, or people in your community, or like if there's somebody in your family that still farms or has land or 
farming equipment, what everybody's own situation will be, will be different. And uh, I think it's just a great time to, to, to do it. For more information, call 225-771-2242 or visit our website at suagcenter.com.